Thank you, Ashley. Well, I hope you had a chance to listen to those words. Powerful, powerful words. Thank you. Well, at the very beginning of this month, um, if you remember, we had the ministry fair. And one of the uh, sessions that we had in the ministry fair was with, was with Dr. Billy Marshall. And he, uh, he taught on contending for the faith, or defending our faith in, in the public arena. And um, I, took, I took that session, and one of the things that really struck me during that session, um, and if you took it, you remember him saying, is he talked about the biblical illiteracy of the church today. The biblical illiteracy. And he talked about that danger of, of the church being biblically illiterate. He talked about if, if your faith is, is you know, this shallow and then suddenly the weight of the world comes pressing down upon you. It just crushes your faith. And, and that's what we're finding in so many believers today. And, 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 and that, that sense that is out there is that, well, I'm, I'm not interested in theology. I just want to love Jesus. You know, I just love Jesus so much, I want to love him. You know, that might sound all noble, that might sound all great, but God doesn't even leave room for that kind of a relationship with Him. And I was thinking about this this past week, and all through Scripture, you know, He preaches against this. Remember Jesus went to the Samaria and the woman at the well, and they, they got talking about religion, and, and, you know, she was all, you know, realizing, oh, he's a you know, prophet, great man, thinking, you know, he's a holy man, and started, you know, talking about, well, we worship in the mountains. And, and Jesus looked at her and said, you worship what you know not. You know, they're biblically illiterate. You don't even know what you're worshiping, but it's, you know, well, well I got the spirit, and it says, those that worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Then you have verses in the Bible that talk about, you know, believers that, you know, you come to Christ and, you know, you're supposed to be growing in your faith. And the depth, it talks about, you know, being in milk and just wanting the milk. That's all I want is the milk. Don't give me the meat of the word, the deep things of God. And, and he chastised them, you know, by, by now you should, you know, you should be able to take the meat of the word. You know, at a time when you should be teaching and leading others. You're still in need of, of, of them to literally hold your hand and, and, and move you forward. You know, we talked about you know, being babes in Christ. And we should be growing in our faith. You know, and in James, you know, book we just finished preaching through, we talked about that danger of, you know, that, that you know, being tossed and fro in our faith. Because we don't have a depth. So I've thought about this, you know, since that session, of what we can do as a body of believers. You know, we, we, we have those things that are important of, you know, fellowship and, you know, worship, and those things are all there, but that's not the basis of what the ministry is. The basis of the ministry is the Word of God, and worshiping Jesus Christ, and knowing more about God, and the deeper, and growing to Him. We begin to make it about so many other things. And we need to get back to, to, to what Christ has taught, called us to. Uh, but then I also realized that, boy, if I take a, a year and teach on theology, you know, you know, a lot of people, it's, you know, we're going to chuck out of this, you know, you know, it's, go over our heads, you know, we're not going to be able to stay focused. What can I do about this? So what I've decided I'm going to be doing is a couple times a month, I'm going to be doing something called the Theology Corner. And what I plan on doing is taking two to three minutes in the service to talk about a biblical theological truth and to take us deeper. And so it's not going to have a lot of illustrations. There's not going to be a lot of humor. You know, I'm not going to be doing things to keep your attention. God's Word needs to keep your attention. You need to want to grow. You need to want to know more about Jesus Christ and the God whom we serve. And so I'm going to ask for you for two to three minutes to, to plug your minds in and, 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 and grow deeper and, and learn about God. And so this morning, I, I want to do the first one. We may be doing that at different times during the services, you know, as we go down. I'm not sure how this is all going to shake out. But I want to begin today, and, and actually for quite some time, as we take these two or three minutes, I'm going to talk to us about sin. Okay, about sin. In, in the theological terms, it's called harmoniology. And, you know, that's a, a, a big, important, you know, big, big word and impressive word. But it just makes, you know, basically the study of sin and that sin nature. And he 
each and every one of us. And well, why is that so important to know? Well, the issue of sin is at the very crux of our salvation. Sin is at the very, at the very heart of our need for a Savior, of why Jesus Christ came to die. So it's important for us to understand sin. Now today in our world, and in churches today, we are making the mistake of making sin about us. When in fact sin is about God. God is the standard. It is we who have fallen away. It's we who have pulled away from our Creator. You know, so, you know, the danger here is when it's about us, when we make sin about us, suddenly sin becomes often defined by culture, even within the church. You know, our culture is getting worse. Well, I'm not as bad as my culture. You know, we begin to grade on a curve or, you know, on the scales of, of weighing it. And suddenly things that are offensive to God, Things that are sin and separate us from our relationship with God, suddenly they become minimized. And we don't think there is big a deal. Well, in Hebrews chapter 13, 8, it says this, and here's our first lesson in, in sin. It says, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, his standard, his holy <coughs> righteousness, it never changes, and it never will change. And, and, and this combats the, 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 the thinking that's out there in our culture. It says, well, if, you know, if Jesus came today and lived in our culture, it would be different. You know, the, the Bible is kind of outdated and, you know, Jesus and all those things that he says because, you know, we've, we've evolved in our culture and, you know, it, it would be different. But that's not true. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we try to redefine what sin is, even if you know, the majority buy into it, it still doesn't change the standard that God is going to you know, deal with us by and, and, and judge us by. You know, I can deny it all I want, but God is that standard. It's like, it'd be like me saying, well, in all these years, I think gravity isn't as strong as it used to be, so you know, it's okay, just, let's just jump off a 10-story building. I, I don't believe gravity. Well, you know, the bottom line is it doesn't really matter what I believe. The truth is, gravity is going to take over, and it's going to be holy to, to the standard. And God is going to do the same thing, so that's why it's so important for us to understand what sin is. So if I had to give you a definition of sin, I'm looking, you know, studying going through my theological books and trying to find the best one that we might be able to get our arms around here. A definition of sin. Sin is the transgression of or lack of conformity to the holy character of God. You know, Transgression of or lack of conforming ourselves to, to, to God, whose image we were created in, who we stepped away and we have pulled away from. You know, putting it in simplest terms, I'm, I'm sure you, you may have heard this term, it means to miss the mark. God is the mark. God is that bullseye. And it's not about trying to get close. It's trying, you know, to, to become in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. Christ, when he walked on this earth, he took on this cultural clash. It's, it's not something new that we're going against trying to redefine sin and minimize and everything. You know, Christ had to do it. He had to even do it to the religious world. If you remember in his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 21, verse uh, uh, 22, he was talking there, you know, about, about murder. And it said there, it says, You have heard that in ancient times were told, You shall not murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you're, you're good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you're a fool shall be guilty enough to go into the, the fires of hell. I mean, culture had changed what the sin was and made it that you just do the big one. As long as you don't act upon it, as long as I don't pull the trigger, you know, my emotion, my feeling, my anger, my jealousy... You know, am I talking about someone else, my gossip? But that's all okay as long as I don't, you know, actually physically hurt someone. Christ said, you've heard what I say unto you. See, that's what God was. He is the mark. Later on in, the, in that sermon, verses 27 28, he was talking about physical relations with adultery. He says, you have heard that it was said you must not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her, 
has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And we put that standard out there again, as long as we don't act on it. You know, that, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a big playing field that we're out there. God says, no. God is the standard. And, and whether I will agree with this or not, I want, I, this, I'm going to be held to this. And that's why we need Jesus Christ the Savior, because who can stand? You know, who can get that holy character of God? That's why it's so important that we keep that standard and we don't water it down and dilute it. Because once we do that, we dilute the need for a Savior. Need for Christ's death. Talk about relationships between one another, verse 43 and 44. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. I mean, we live in a culture that, you know, it is open game on, on, on anybody to be able to say about them. You know, whether it's privately, on the, on the internet, computer, and YouTube, we, you know, say that you don't have to stand for it. He said, no, we love our enemy, even, even if you're right about it. Are your actions in love towards that person? And when they are not, we are breaking the holy character of God. So the question I'm going to leave with you, um, and, and kind of the application of why this is important, our, our question is, you know, what would God look at in our world today and say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. What are we as Christians right now even living and doing in that, that we have bit, bit into our culture? And say, so, well, you've heard it said, but, but I, need, I need to draw you back to the holy standard and the holy you know, character of God. So, Father, I'm just going to ask you to you know, deal with this within our heart, this great truth, Lord. I thank you, Father, that in the midst of revealing our sinful nature and our desperateness, Father, you, you want to do this because you want us to see our need and to abandon ourselves and to connect to Jesus Christ and rest in his death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, to accept him as the Lord and as the Savior of our life. Father, I ask you just to bless your word as it goes out, Father. Uh, help us to apply it. In thy son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, in 1939, there was a man, a gentleman named George Danzig. He was enrolled as a graduate student at the University of California, and he was studying statistics. Not something real exciting to us, but you know, we deal with statistics and things that you know every single day from you know our light, uh, our our as we drive the the lights, you know, as they go on and as they're timed and shipping and all these things. So he's dealing in, in in statistics that deal with that. Well, at the beginning of one class, the professor wrote up on the chalkboard two examples of two unsolvable problems that there were in the world, statistical problems. He wrote them up on the board. Well, that day, George came in late from class, and he missed the professor's statement about these problems being unsolvable, and he mistaken them for being the homework assignment that everyone was supposed to take and everyone was supposed to do. So six weeks later, after working on these problems, six weeks, he turned in what he thought was his homework. He was later visited by the professor who informed him that he had solved two of statistics' unsolvable problems. And for George Danzig, that became a springboard into a tremendous career. And, and there are so many things right now I won't even mention that, that, that his mind and statistics that, that we are still living in today because of George Danzig. He was once interviewed about his, his career and, and, and all of his accomplishments. And in his own words, he said this. He said, if someone had told me that there were two unsolvable problems, I probably wouldn't even have tried them. But the very fact that he didn't know they were unsolvable brought him to the place of doing something that no one else could do. You know, in our faith, there are many times that we make assumptions about what is and isn't possible, or can or can't be. You know, yeah, we share it with you know. We know we pray, and you know, God is out there, and you know, He's working. But, but so often we live the reality of our lives with with assumptions of of just what life is and what it's come to. 
I was thinking about this um, a couple weeks ago as I was working towards this message, and, and, and I was taken to the very beginning of the, the Gospels when the angel Gabriel visited the teenager Mary. And it's going to announce, you know, the virgin birth to her. And you're going to conceive and bear a son. And, and remember what Mary said to the angel. He said, how can this be? For I am a virgin. And making assumptions. You know, it, this, this isn't possible. And it's not so much her response to that, but I love what the angel said back to her. Not only does he address her concern, you know, that, that, that she's a virgin, she's never been married before, but he also adds, as he's explaining to her, he also brings in what God is doing in Elizabeth's life, who was going to be the mother of John the Baptist. Elizabeth was on the other extreme. She was old. She was barren. She wasn't able to have children. She had been married for years and wasn't able to have any children. And so as the angel is explaining this to her, you know, it's kind of like he brings in both extremes of, of Mary, young, never married a virgin, you know, a lady way past the, the years of bearing. And then he says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. The angel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Now I want you to look at this verse long and hard. Do we, do we put this verse up there? Okay, thank you. We'll bring it back here. I want you to look at this verse long and hard. And I want you to look at your life and what you're going through right now. You know, what you're going through in your faith. Do you believe this? It's a very simple statement that God has made. But the ramifications for our life are far-reaching. Do you believe that nothing will be impossible for God? It's stated again in, a little bit later in Mark chapter 10, verse 27. It says, looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but with God, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Well, today we're going to look at the third miracle. Uh, we've been looking at the seven miracles that Christ performed in, in, in the book of John that are recorded there. And this is going to be our burning question that we face today. Do we believe? Do you believe that with God nothing's impossible? So I'm going to invite you, we're going to be in John chapter 5, I'm going to invite you to stand as I read our text this morning. If you would stand together, John chapter 5, follow with me. If you're not there already, get turned there. It's going to be important. We're going to be in this text. We're not going to be uh, in a lot of other scriptures, but we're going to be focusing here. Verses 1 through 9, John chapter 5. It says, And after these things... There was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain season, uh, seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever then, whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in, was made well. And whatever disease which they had, with which he was afflicted, um, he was healed. A man was there who had been ill for thir 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well. And he picked up his pallet and he began to walk. Maybe see him. Now before we get to the very heart of this message, I do want to preface something. We are going to look, be looking at, you know, and asking God to do miracles. Do you believe God does miracles? Do you ask God to do miracles in your life? You know, whether big or small. And we're going to be talking about that's going to be our focus. And, you know, it, it's probably going to raise all sorts of questions here that we're not going to deal with specifically in this message. So I just want to focus on that, that one point today. 
You know, and, and there are all sorts of questions. You know, you, people say, well, what, you know, why don't most of my prayers get answered? You know, I, I pray and I pray and everything seemingly goes unanswered. You know, questions like, well, where does faith come in? And if I believe hard enough, you know, where, where's my part to things that happen because I don't believe hard enough? You know, when we do, you know, uh, when do we and how do we know when we're praying and asking God to do a miracle and it's not happening? How do I know when God is just, you know, trying to drive me to persevere with Him or, and, and wait and He's going to answer it? Or how do I know He said no? You know, when I, and I accept where I'm at. There's a lot of these questions that are out there. And, and we're not going to answer them today. Um, and we've touched on some of these over the, the, a couple of the messages in this sermon. And by the end of the series, we're going to get to all of those questions. But for today, I want us to narrow the focus to this question. Do we believe that nothing is impossible with God? Do we still believe that? And do we live that as Christians? And even more specifically... You know, we're not just going to believe generally, oh, God can do anything. But do you believe in your life that God can do a miracle? That God will do a miracle in your life? You see, this is an important question. Because all around us in church, Christianity is being reduced down to a set of moral codes. You know, things that we live by, how we live our life. And that, that vibrant interactive relationship with God where he is actively moving in our lives you know setting up divine appointments you know has given way to routine and, and even in our areas of service and ministry that we do for the Lord so often our expectation our pursuit of the miraculous is replaced by where we're just going to work hard we're just going to be faithful into this ministry that, that, that God has given me Faith, seeking God, it doesn't ignore a, a doctor's diagnosis and we find that we have a terminal illness. It doesn't ignore that. That's, faith doesn't ignore that. What we're talking about is, are we willing to go seek a second opinion? Do we believe to go to God and to say, you know, man has determined this, but God, with you, nothing is impossible. And, and, and we make far too many assumptions about what is and isn't possible. And as a result, our logical assumptions begin to trump our theological beliefs. And before you know it, the reality that we are living in our faith is more defined by human assumptions than by divine revelation. So today our miracle is going to challenge that. It's going to reignite, hopefully, a relationship with God, you know, and the God of the miraculous. So first of all, I want to look at the context of the setting. It's very important if you want to understand what's going on here. The context that, is, that this happens is, is important. It says in verse 2 and 3, it says, Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. Now, archaeology believes that it has uncovered this pool that's referred to here in Scripture. Um, it would have been one of the many washing pools. These pools weren't unique. You know, they were all over Jerusalem. You know, they, they were used for ceremonial cleaning, for, for bathing. And um, we don't know, you know, exactly how it happened. But somehow this particular pool that was, you know, by the Sheep Gate, this pool fostered the belief that it had healing power, you know, um, of the day in archaeology, you know, of that particular pool, like many of the pools of their day, they were actually fed by springs. And, and I'm not sure if, you know, something in the spring was happening, but the water would stir, and, you know, somehow it fostered that if you get in there first, you know, whoever got there first, you know, would be healed. So it says there at the end of verse 3, and it goes on, it says, they're waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in was made well for from whatever disease in which he was afflicted. Now, don't take that statement right there. Don't take that statement that this actually was God working, that God was doing this. If you look in your Bibles very, very carefully, those, 
the end of verse 3 and all of verse 4 is in parentheses. And when it's, in, when it's italicized or it's in parentheses, it, it gives an indication that those verses were not there in the original writings. Okay, we hold that God's word is, is, is perfect and, you know, in its original writings. You know, but as it's been copied, you know, over year after year, you know, there are, are small things that have been added. And this is one of the things that at, at some point got added. You know, and it was added in a way of, that somehow, you know, th this, this is, is, is what was happening. You know, that somehow, you know, God, you know, was with all these lame people and sick people around that every once in a while God would send an angel down and stir it, and let's see who gets there first. You know, is that anywhere else in scripture? You know, the God even would work like that, you know, have this race and oh he got there second light. Sorry about that. You know, it's it's all based on speed and attentiveness and you know so so it, it, it's pretty good indication that that, that was added. Uh, again, but this was a belief that had gone on time. We don't know how it got that belief. But but evidently, you know, it was a very strong belief because there were many who were sick and lame who had lost hope. And they were now beginning to put their, their hope in this of something they had heard. That that they might be the one, you know, that God would you know, heal. And so every day of every year for this man that we're talking about here, every day of every year, year after year after year, you know, he would come to the pool along with the sick and the lame and the blind and the handicapped. And they would all gather around that pool and they would hope. And, and when the water stirred for whatever reason, you know, something going on in the spring would stir, you know, they would all, you know, mad dash to be first. And, and you kind of look at it, you, you think, yeah, it may seem silly to have all these, you know, these crazy hopes that we, we put in, but, you know, we, we have our own crazy things. I was thinking about this, and I remember when I was younger, um, in, in high school, I, I wanted to be a great runner. You know, I loved running, and I wanted to be a great runner. I actually went out in a storm, in a lightning storm, and ran, thinking that if I got struck by lightning while I was running, I'd become the Flash. <laughs> and uh, so, I was a teenager, okay? My, everything wasn't connected yet from year to year. <laughs> so, uh, but we had those things. You know, we have, we have those beliefs. And, you know, the opposite of belief isn't just unbelief, but it's also a false belief. And, and a lot of times we have a, a, a false belief. So it goes on in verse 5 and it says this, A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Now let's think back to the very beginning. You know, that first year, that first time, that first doctor's appointment, whatever it was, whether he was a child, an adult, teenager, but when the doctor, they saw, you know, announced, you will never walk again. You're never going to walk again. And for 38 years, those are the words that he lived with. Those were the reality of his life. It echoed in his mind. And we don't know how it happened. We don't know if there was a birth defect. We don't know if some freak accident but this man had not stood on his own two feet for close to four decades. And if you consider that the average lifespan of a male 2,000 years ago, the average lifespan of a male was somewhere in the 40s. Folks, this man was past his prime. And we don't know exactly how old he is, but we know he'd at least been afflicted for, for 38 of those years. And if you think about it, I think maybe this is the whole point of Jesus, why he singled this man out. I mean, we know, and we've already talked about this in our lessons on miracles, we know that miracles aren't about us. Miracles aren't about making my life better or making my life easier or taking care of something in my life. God uses miracles to reveal himself. Miracles about, are about God. You know, he is that focus and his power doing either doing something in our life or something in the world, something, you know, in the people who, who witness it. But it, it's not about us. It's not about taking care of problems that we have. It's about a revealing of God. You know, certainly having our problems taken care of and being healed from something or, you know, God providing in, in a miraculous way. I mean, that's icing on the cake. And we praise God for that. But that, that's not the focus. That's not the purpose of miracles. And so out of the hundreds that were gathered around that pool that day, you know, hoping, waiting, Jesus picks this man out. 
Perhaps I think he picked this man out because of the length of his affliction. And if you think about it, the human hopelessness that he must have been going through. And in that moment, Jesus shows us that no matter how bad it is, no matter how long it is that you have been enduring what it is that you're enduring on this side of eternity, no matter what's going on in your life, nothing is impossible for God. Jesus knows the logical or chronological limits to what he can do. And there's a beautiful uh, children's rhyme, God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. There's nothing beyond the ability of what God can do. And he's about to show us that in this man's life. I want to talk a little bit about the assumptions that we make and, and how those assumptions limit our relationship with God. And also they limit our being able to see the miraculous. I want to first consider the paralytic himself. Um, this man who had been, you know, hasn't walked for 38 years. Uh, but folks, it doesn't take a whole lot of reading between the lines to understand what this man's life was like. Especially back in, you know, Israel in those days. You know, to this point he had pretty much resigned himself to live a life of a cripple. And for the life of a cripple back then, it meant begging. That's how you made your living. Most of the cripples, most of the beggars, they had a, a mat called a pallet. It was a four by four mat. And they would put their mat out and they would sit on that mat. And they would beg and all day. That was their life. 16 square feet. You know, defined by their affliction. And so for 38 years, no human hope whatsoever. His life had become basically accepting his human limitations. You know, his, his human expectations, they were gone. And in fact, his life consisted of chasing old wives' tales. You know, if I get down in the water, some of God will, will, will heal me. And even, even this belief that he had, you kind of sense a hopelessness in this man. I mean, he said in verse 7, the sick man answered Jesus and said, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. And when the water is stirred up, you know, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. You know, it's, it's even this, this thing he had placed his hope in, he said, I have no way of even plugging into that because I can't walk. And, and somebody else who maybe has a, you know, a, a, a hand deformity or something like that, can get down there fast. You know, they're always beating me out. You know, it's, it, it's like, it's like this life, excuse me, it, it's like this in our life so often. You know, we, we say theologically that God can heal the flesh. We say theologically that God can touch and change a heart. We say theologically that God can heal broken emotions. But that is for someone else. I mean, deep down, we don't believe that God is going to do it. We'll pray for, we pray for other people, but really our hope, we, we, we've, we've made the assumption that God is not going to do it for us. And so what we do in Christianity is we have a tendency to set into this moral relationship with God, never believing that God can do a miracle. I was looking at doing some research on this, and, and according to reach searchers, I am told that children ask 125 probing questions per day. 125 questions. Why? Why not? Why? Why not? Adults ask only six probing questions. Now, okay, some might because we know the answers and that, but, but there's such a huge disparity that somewhere between childhood and adulthood, we've lost 119 questions. Because what happens is when we get older, the more set we become, instead of asking questions of why not? Why not me? Why not God do this? Why not God move? Instead of asking that question, we start making assumptions. We, we just know how life works. We've been through this before. We've seen this so often, seen this in other people's lives. And it's these assumptions that make us like this man spiritually crippled, spiritually handicapped, resigned to this is my life. This is what it's going to be. I still believe in God. 
You know, is there any wonder that Jesus said you know, that we're needing to have the faith of a child? You know, who when said, you tell a child, you know, something can happen, you know, they don't say, well, that ain't possible. There's a way that you're going to catch me if I jump off these stairs. You know, that, you know, they, it, a child just believes. But we begin, we adults, we begin to make assumptions based on our experiences. You know, I've been sick before and I've prayed for healing and, and I've not been healed. You know, I've been sick before and, you know, we pray and the sickness just kind of runs its course or I get medicine or I get uh, surgery and, and, and somehow, you know, that, that's how it happens. You know, we've run into this problem before and, and, and I've not had success. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. And it's only gotten worse. Well, folks, this is why Jesus singled out this man, 38 years crippled, for 13,870 days, nothing changed for this man. And he settled into the norm. Matter of fact, you know, one of the points we, we could highlight here, what we're just going to mention is the interesting thing is that he didn't even ask Jesus for the miracle. You know, it says Jesus kind of walked up to him and all those he picked him out of the crowd. To do this, this, this healing and this, this miracle. So it's, it's very purposeful why Jesus did this to teach us something. You see, folks, God's working is so far beyond our understanding. I can't tell you why prayers go unanswered. You know, actually, I can't tell you all prayers are answered. Sometimes you just don't like the answer. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is, is wait. But I love this, in, in this book that, by Mark Batterson that, that I've been kind of using with this, I love he makes that statement. He says, I can't tell you, you know, I don't totally understand God's moving and everything he's doing, but I can tell you that God won't answer 100% of the prayers that you don't pray. The problem comes when we stop believing, we stop asking, we stop trusting. If you assume the answer is no, you don't even give a chance, God a chance to say yes. And so Sunday school teacher, what are you asking God to do in your Sunday school class? I mean, are you praying for these children and that God might do a mighty work and raise them up? You Awana workers. You know, and, and you sit there and oh, you know, Awana's a long, you know, and every Wednesday night and the kids are, you know, and you've got these four kids here, they're, they're learning the verses and, and it's easy just to, to, to do what we're responsible, to be faithful, to work hard at it. But are you even asking God to do something powerful in their lives? Folks, somebody, there was some Sunday school teacher who taught D.L. Moody and was part of a miracle in his life of transformation, of regeneration, and is part of what D.L. Moody and the fruit that he brought of so many to be saved. Do you believe that any of these kids that you are teaching, that that could be the next D.L. Moody or Billy Graham? That God could do that? Are you even asking? God to do something like that in our kids' lives? In our missions? You know, in our ministries, whatever it is, what are we asking God? Are we asking Him to do the possible or the impossible? You know, in your family, with that child that you've been praying and you've been praying and been praying for, do you still believe that God, no matter how long it is, that God is not confined by time? That God can still do a miracle? In your workplace, you look at that person, you think, oh, that person's never going to come to Christ. Do you believe that God can do a miracle? That God can, can change a heart? You know, it's so interesting. We were, uh, and I know I'm a little bit over here, um, we were at uh, Jared Policy's wedding yesterday um, over in, uh, by Ship Shawani and, and that area. And uh, while we were there, Martha and I, we came, went up the night before, and we stayed with a Mennonite family that just housed us and opened up the house. We never met them before. And we got talking with them, and, and they just shared a miracle with us. That the, this past January, there was a 92-year-old Amish man who was, his heart was broken over, you know, what was happening in the Amish community and the relationship with God. The things were just becoming pharisaical and, you know, the rules and, you know, the heart for God was going. 92-year-old Amish man contacted an evangelist, a revivalist in Texas, and began
began the ball moving to bring this man up and to, to speak in the area. Well, one thing led to another, and, 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 and the revivalist came, and his team, and the prep work, and got all the churches together, and started taking down denominational walls and making it only about Jesus Christ, not about themselves, and, you know, all of the differences and all of that. And that week-long revival lasted 52 days, and it changed the community. A 92-year-old Amish man got lit the spark on Last person in the world would have thought of it. Kind of the sad thing they said after that, that 92-year-old Amish man was then shunned uh, by his community because of his, his part in this. But God can do miracles. God can still work. God can still move in your life. Do you believe that? So I've been I've been kind of looking at, at, at this, knowing where we're going in the preaching. I've really been you know challenged by this. And so how can we apply this? How can I apply this in my life? How can we apply this in our church, in our church here? Well, I thought I, I have a prayer request for you. And I'm going, I ask you to just pray with me. We'll pray for this at the end of the service. But I have a prayer request for you. We need as a church, we need a 10 to 15 passenger van. We desperately need a 10 to 15 passenger van. We have our Awana outreach, you know, particularly in just one area that we go to, out in, into the Honey Creek area. And we pick up between 15 to 17 kids during the Awana. Um, and I'm, I praise the Lord for the Islanders who come out and help but I mean, we're packing 10, 11 kids in vehicles. And, and we aren't even trying to reach out anymore because we can't bring the kids. We need the van. We have a missions trip coming up, you know, at the, at the very beginning of July. We need a van. If we had a van for that, well, how wonderful it would be to not have to take three, four vehicles and, you know, all the way, you know, to Oklahoma City, but, you know, only, maybe you only have to take two or one, depending on how many people go and how big the van is. You know, youth could be using it. You know, the seniors could be using it, you know, for when they go to their luncheons. But the truth of it is, we don't have the money right now for the van because, you know, we've gone through this before, um, you know, probably 13, 14 years ago and got a couple of old vans and we had some buses and they constantly broke down, they broke down on the trips. And, and so what I'm asking you to pray for is that a van will be given to us. I don't know how, I don't know how God will provide this. I'm just asking you to pray that a van will be given to us, a van that is a, a newer type of a van, you know, one that's not, you know, having, you know, lower miles and doesn't have, you know, tons of mechanical things. We have someone in our congregation already who God has provided that will help mechanically take care of the van. I've talked to the trustees about this already. You know, we have the means that once we get the van, you know, that we can get insurance on it and, and we can do the upkeep of the van. That's why I'm asking you to pray. I don't know if God's going to provide it. But we have the need, and I believe our God can do that in, in a way that is so far beyond anything that we you know, can ask and imagine. I'm asking you to pray with me to believe that God can do something that's totally unrealistic. I was going to drop a van in the middle of our laps. And so just pray with me. Okay, real quickly here, and I know we're just we're a little bit over here. Real quickly here. There's another group um, that was being held back because of their religious assumptions. This, this paralytic was, he was being held back because of his assumptions. But there was also another group. There was a religious group. It says in verse 9 and 10, it says, Immediately the man became well. He picked up his pallet and he began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. I drop down to verse 16. It says, Now for this reason the Jews are persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Well, let me first be clear here. Jesus healing on the Sabbath. This man rolling up his 4x4 four four mat and carrying it broke absolutely no law of God whatsoever. None. You know, but over the centuries, the Jews had compiled... A, a, a comprehensive list of religious do's and don'ts and how these things were supposed to be applied. There were over 613 codified laws that they added to the law of God. It's called the mitzvah. 
You know, define things down to the minutest detail of, of, of what this means. And in this area, for example, their law said the maximum walking distance on the Sabbath was 2,000 cubits in a straight line if you were outside of the city. In other words, if you were inside of the city, you could walk, you know, wherever you want in the city. I mean, it was probably only a mile by a mile. You can always get to your place. But if you go outside the city, you could only go 2,000 cubits. And then they added... This measurement didn't start until you were 70 and two-thirds cubits outside of the city already. And then you, after 70 and two-thirds, then you could go another 2,000. So literally, you could walk roughly six-tenths of a mile. You know, leave the city. If your home was past that, you couldn't. You were stuck in the city. And if you got caught on the Sabbath, that, you know, that, that was the law. You know, but, and we have our own religious assumptions that we tend to make and we tend to to squeeze God into and make him work in between. And we have versions of the Bible that you know, people believe that God blesses if you're using a certain version of the Bible. And we have certain styles of music that we believe, you know, God blesses this style of music more than the others. Oh, how can you get anything out of that? You know, so we think our style of music is what God is going to use. We have assumptions of when and where we think people get saved. You know, one of the big assumptions is get them to church. Get them to church, that's where the people get saved. Well, that's great if people get saved here, but you know, the church is for believers, you know, to, to go out and do the work. You know, and so but when we have we begin to close that down and think, well, my job is just to get, get people to church, then I am missing God using me to do a miracle. I don't even ask God to open up the door for me to witness to a person at work or witness to my neighbor and have that blessing of reaping the fruit and seeing somebody come to know Christ as a savior. And say, God, would it be me? We don't even ask that. And, and our religious assumptions begin to confine how we believe God is and will act. And even what we would expect of God. So in our assumptions, we miss God doing miracles. Or we miss God using us to be part of a miracle. Now Jesus, he could have visited this pool any time of the week. He could have chosen this man any other day except for them the Sabbath, which was on Saturday. But he purposely chose the Sabbath to reveal that he works outside the boxes that we create. We create boxes. God blows the walls off of boxes. And if you keep God in the box, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting the same results. You know, and that, that, isn't that the definition of what insanity is? You know, and that's okay, doing the same thing, getting the same, if, if you're, you're, you're living and active and engaged and power-filled, you're living that life with Christ, that's great. But if you are not, if your faith has stalled out, you know, it's easy to look around you and find all sorts of problems out there. But it's always in here. Your faith is stalled out. You know, turn God loose in your life. You know, you know, Jesus asked this man a somewhat weird question in, in verse 6. Remember he said, he said, when Jesus saw him lying there, knew he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? You know, our sarcastic experience would say, duh, of course I wish to get well. That's kind of a, a, a silly question. Let me ask you, do you wish to grow in Christ? Do you wish to see God work? Then take a step of faith. Do something outside of the box. Expect God to do something. You know, don't just go in the routine. Because our God is working outside of the routine. Take a step of faith, and then another step of faith, and another step of faith. And God will get you there that place that he has called you. But if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to keep getting the same results. The church as individuals. You see, half of faith is learning what we don't know. I need to learn about God and learn about faith. I think the other half of faith is unlearning what we do know. The assumptions that have been bred into us through our culture and through our upbringing and sometimes even through our, our teaching in church. Assumptions, limitations. They cause us to not even ask God. I want to close with uh, a quote from Mark Batterson. He's 
giving him kind of a translation of how God works in miracles. I'll take this right out of his book. It says this. He said, God is predictably unpredictable. You never know exactly how or when or where God might show up and show off. But you can be sure of this. He will probably ask you to do something unprecedented, unorthodox, and unconventional. And, you have, and if you have the courage to do something you haven't done in 38 years, you might just experience something you haven't seen in a long, long time. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand with me. We're going to pray about this. I appreciate your attentiveness. I know we're over. This is important. Our God is a God of miracles. We're going to close in prayer here, and, and I, I'm asking you to pray with me in faith. God, we need a van. Lord, we come to you right now as a body of Christ. Our heart and our desire, Lord, is to reach, you know, reach the world for Christ. We're doing that through mission. We're doing that through so many things. But Father, you know that that we seem to have this hurdle of being able to. You know, in this, this ministry, particularly of Rwanda and, and, and some other ministries, Lord, of being able to go out and bring the people. And so I'm asking you, Father, to meet this need. And, and I know we're, I'm asking for a van. We're asking for a van. God, maybe it's going to be a different way you're going to meet this need. I don't know. But, but Lord, I, I believe in faith that you can do this. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. But I put it in your hands, Lord provide for us. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us right now. Help us to search our heart and our soul. To be able to answer that question, Father, do we believe that you are the God of miracles? Do we believe that nothing is impossible with God? Father, as we answer that, if it's a yes, Father, help us to live that. Live like you know, we, in, in this truth. Father, if we're struggling this, I pray that you will give us that area that you want us to step out in faith. And we will thank you, Father, as we go forth from here to be the church of Christ, Lord, to be your hands and feet. Dismiss us, Lord, with your grace and mercy.